Hey, what's up guys? Kai here, and this video is going to be very different than the videos I usually make. This past semester in college, I took an anthropology class that focused on race and ethnicity. In this class, I learned about something called racial projects. In the book Racial Formation in the United States, Michael Omi and Howard Winnett define a racial project as simultaneously an interpretation, representation, or explanation of racial identities and meanings and an effort to organize and distribute resources, economic, political, cultural, along particular racial lines. They go on to say that racial projects connect what race means in a particular discursive or ideological practice and the ways in which both social structures and everyday experiences are racially organized based upon that meaning. Racial projects are attempts both to shape the ways in which social structures are racially signified and the ways that racial meanings are embedded in social structures. So upon learning about racial projects, I started trying to think about my own life and where racial projects may play a role in my own experiences. And I mean, really, racial projects are all around us all the time, but these racial projects just happen all around us without us ever really stopping to think about them in a more in-depth way. But I started thinking about this hashtag I use, actually, on Instagram which is hashtag TPOC. And just in case anyone does not know, TPOC stands for Transgender Person of Color. And like I said, I've started using this hashtag as well with some of my own Instagram pictures. And so upon learning about racial projects, I started thinking about this hashtag TPOC in a different way and started wondering, is hashtag TPOC a racial project? And that's kind of what I wanted to discuss with you guys today using some outside research, some scholarly articles I found, as well as some of the readings I had to do throughout the semester in this anthropology class, I wanted to kind of make an argument for why I think hashtag TPOC is a racial project. In order to do that though, I think we first need to start from the beginning. And to me, the beginning is looking at just the role of hashtags in activism, specifically racial activism, because there has been a lot more of that in recent years. And if we look at the role of hashtags when it comes to race, I think then it's not quite as big of a jump to start looking at the role of hashtags when it comes to race in addition to having a transgender identity as well. So the first article I want to discuss is from the journal American Ethnologist, and I'm going to put the authors on the screen because I don't want to butcher any names, so probably the rest of the articles I talk about, I'm going to put the authors' names on the screen. But the title is Hashtag Ferguson, Digital Protest, Hashtag Ethnography, and the Racial Politics of Social Media in the United States. Basically, to give a brief overview of what this article talks about, as you can probably tell from the title, it talks a lot about the hashtag Ferguson and the role that's played in race-related activism. For anyone who might not be aware, hashtag Ferguson refers to an incident in 2014 when an unarmed black teenager named Michael Brown was shot and killed by a police officer. One thing this article talks about that I think is relevant to my greater argument about hashtag TPOC being a racial project is it talks about the roles of hashtags in kind of organizing information and creating a location where people can go to find information on a certain topic. This article really focuses on hashtags on Twitter, which I want to focus on hashtags on Instagram, but I still think it's really important to look at because it still is talking about hashtags. Hashtags basically serve the same purpose as they do on Twitter and Instagram. I think on Twitter, people tend to use hashtags a little bit more, and they have like trending hashtags and stuff like that. Whereas Instagram, it's more of you really have to go out of your way to search up a certain hashtag. But in the same sense, both on Twitter and Instagram, hashtags serve as a way to organize information, whether it be pictures or words, into a certain location and create a way for people to access that information even if that information is not on their normal feed. Another thing that this Ferguson article points out that I think is important is that social media like Twitter, or in this, in my case, Instagram, is a way for people to share their own stories. So especially minoritized communities like people of color or 
in my case, also transgender individuals. Social media can be a place that they can share their own stories and get their own news out there when mainstream media sometimes, or a lot of times, doesn't focus on those stories or does not tell them in the same way that a person of color would. Finally, the last thing I want to point out from this Ferguson article is it does mention how hashtags and just the use of social media in general can serve as community building and connect people with others who have the same beliefs and hopes and goals as they do. The next article I wanted to talk about is called Recounting Racism, Resistance, and Repression, Examining the Experiences and Hashtag Activism of College Students with critical race theory and counter narratives. So the important parts of this article that I wanted to take out were that it does talk about how hashtag activism, which is basically a form of activism seen through social media with the use of hashtags, has kind of transformed for something that was seen as not effective, not productive, kind of like a lazy form of activism, to now something that people are seeing can actually make a difference, can actually give a voice to people, and kind of more of a legitimate form of activism. This article has some of the same ideas from the Ferguson article. It talks about hashtags related to criminalization of black men and boys and the police brutality that is a result of that. This article also brings up a few tenets of critical race theory, which is something I learned about in my anthropology class as well and it talks about two tenets in particular. First is kind of the white interpretations of black experiences. Basically a tenet of critical race theory says that people of color are going to be able to explain their own experiences in ways that white people just will not be able to and because of that people of color are the best people to explain their own experiences, which seems like common sense, but the narratives for people of color are often whitewashed and told from a white perspective because white people have the power when it comes to race, so they are able to be the ones who tell the stories when people of color should really be telling their own stories. And people of color are going to be able to tell stories that white people are not going to be able to because people of color are the only ones who have those experiences. This is why social media can be such a great place for people of color to start discussing their experiences and get a voice because they are able to directly share their own experiences in their own words without having it go through this filter of white systems and institutions and news media outlets and all that stuff. The other tenet is just that race is ordinary. It's a normal, everyday part of life. And by normal, I don't mean right or natural. I mean it happens. It's not something that can be contested as not happening. And it is real. And every day people experience prejudice and discrimination related to their race. With both those tenets together, we see how important it is for social media to be a place for people of color to have an outlet, to have a voice, to be able to share their own experiences in their own words because it is a normal, usual part of life for them. The other thing that this article, Recounting Racism, talks about is how social media serves as an informer, an organizer, and a mobilizer. And basically that's saying that through the use of things like hashtags, people are able to get information out there. They're able to get it to other people, and other people are able to find it. In addition, kind of piggybacking off the same ideas when I was talking about the Ferguson article, people are able to use social media to join together to create a community and to have a connected movement throughout the use of social media. So the basic ideas I was hoping you would take away from both of these articles is just that social media and hashtags in particular can really serve an important role in getting information out there and having a place where people can access it, a way to find that information, a way to connect people through space and time through the use of social media and actually have kind of like a physical location for these discussions to happen. So now that we understand the role that hashtags can play in race-related activism, I think it's important to start looking at intersectionality and how that plays a role 
in the lives of people with both of the identities of transgender and person of color. So in my anthropology class this past semester, we had a reading called Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. And this was written by Kimberly Crenshaw. The main reason I wanted to bring up this reading that I had this semester in anthropology is because Kimberly Crenshaw gives this really great analogy that I think really can help understand intersectionality and how it plays a role in people's lives. I'm going to read directly from the reading. I quote, Consider an analogy to traffic in an intersection coming and going in all four directions. Discrimination, like traffic through an intersection, may flow in one direction and it may flow in another. If an accident happens in an intersection, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. Similarly, if a black woman is harmed because she is in the intersection, her injury could result from sex discrimination or race discrimination. So, as you may have noticed from that, Kimberly Crenshaw is really focusing on the intersection of being a woman and a person of color, or a black woman specifically. So she's looking at sexism and racism. I want to look at cissexism and racism, so it's not that far of a jump. And I think it can be really helpful to look at this analogy that Kimberly Crenshaw is trying to describe for us. I actually want to try a little thing here, and I want to try to kind of recreate this analogy with some poster boards, some markers, and some matchbox cars. All right, so this is my road. I know it's not perfect, but it'll do. And this is our person in the middle. And so the different roads, depending on how many you have coming at you, represent the ability for oppression or discrimination or all that to be there. So some people may have none. They're not even on the road. Some people may have one. Maybe these roads don't exist. And this road right here is just like a one-way road. So they're watching from things coming from this direction. Sometimes things are going to come from this direction. Sometimes it's just a possibility of things coming from that direction. You can have one, two, three, four, even more different directions that things are coming at you from depending on how many oppressed identities you have. So let's say a transgender person of color may have two or three or even four depending on their other identities as well. So you have people coming from you at all different directions that you have to try to navigate. And let's say even if no one's coming from these two directions right at the moment, there's always a possibility for, for something to come from those directions. I think that's what I like that this kind of represents is that if you're in the road, there's always a possibility for something to come from that direction. So just because it's not hitting you directly at the moment doesn't mean it won't or it can't. It's still there. The possibility is still there and it's something that's still going to be present in your life. But at the time being, maybe only two directions are coming at you. And sometimes they both come at you at the same time and they both hit you at the same time. And that's, I think, a lot what Crenshaw was trying to demonstrate, and I hope I demonstrated it well here, sometimes. Uh, so even though things are just coming from this direction right now, from these two directions, or even just one direction, doesn't mean that these roads aren't still there. And at any time, a car can, or oppression, can come from this direction, or that direction, or that direction. And yeah, I hope that was kind of a Nice little demonstration. So I hope that helped you understand intersectionality a little bit and kind of picture it for your own mind. But one thing I didn't mention from this article by Kimberly Crenshaw is that at the very beginning, she starts off by talking about some legal cases 
in which black women were trying to file lawsuits based on the discrimination they faced in the workplace. And they were trying to point out the fact that they face both sexism and racism, and the combination of these two made its own perfect storm for them to face discrimination that was different from white women and different from black men, but still the same in a way. I know that might not make much sense, but basically my point is that because of the combination of race discrimination and sex discrimination, black women could face discrimination based on sex or race or both. And white women and black men did not face this same threat of discrimination coming from multiple directions. So going back to kind of this intersection analogy that Kimberly Crenshaw painted for us and I tried to demonstrate, Kimberly Crenshaw goes on to say that really only acknowledging one flow of the traffic, one direction of the discrimination is not good enough because sometimes you can't determine which exact way the discrimination came from or even sometimes it really truly did come from both ways simultaneously. And if we apply this to the intersection analogy, it's basically like saying we are not going to help the injured person who got hit by these cars if we cannot determine which specific car hit her. And I think it does not matter which car hit her. I think if we have an injured person and there was this threat of injury from two different ways, we need to try to help the person regardless of which car hit her and sometimes even both cars hit her at the same time, in which case we're not going to find one or the other, and then does that just mean she doesn't get help? So anyways, that's the basic reason why I wanted to bring this article into the discussion, because I think it really does do a good job of creating a image we can refer to when thinking of intersectionality, as well as pointing out how not acknowledging intersectionality can be harmful to the people who experience oppression, discrimination, and all that based on intersecting identities. So understanding intersectionality and why it's important to acknowledge how discrimination can affect a person based on all the identities they have. I wanted to actually look at some statistics related to the discrimination and oppression that transgender people of color face. So first I went to Human Rights Campaign, hrc.org, and they had a page titled Being African American and LGBTQ, an introduction. So some of the statistics that this page had talked about economic insecurity, violence and harassment, and criminal injustice. With economic insecurity, a 2012 report found that 34% of black transgender people lived in extreme poverty and that's compared to just 9% of cisgender black people. With violence and harassment, within the LGBTQ community, black transgender women face the highest levels of violence, and that's fatal violence, so it results in their death. At the same time, black transgender women are the least likely to turn to police for support and help because they fear re-victimization. And according to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, 38% of the individuals who reported having interacted with the police reported harassment. 14% reported physical assault from the police and 6% reported sexual assault. And then with criminal injustice, data from a 2011 National Transgender Discrimination Survey found disproportionately high arrests for black transgender individuals when compared to all other racial and ethnic groups. A second site I went to just to see if there were any more statistics I could find was the taskforce.org. Some of the statistics on here included 26% of black transgender individuals reported unemployment, which was two times the rate of the overall transgender population and four times the rate of the general population. 41% of black transgender respondents said that they experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. That's more than five times the rate of the general U.S. population. 
34% of Black transgender individuals reported a yearly household income of less than $10,000. That's more than twice the rate of the general transgender population, four times the rate of the general Black population, and eight times greater than the general U.S. population. 20% of Black transgender individuals who responded reported living with HIV, and that is compared to 2.6% of the general transgender population and 2.4% of the general Black population, and also compared to 0.6% of the general U.S. population. Also, half of Black respondents reported experiencing harassment at school, and 49% of Black transgender respondents reported having attempted suicide. In addition to the statistics, I also found a scholarly article that talks about the healthcare experiences of transgender people of color. Right in the introduction of this article, it discusses how, while healthcare experiences of people of color and transgender individuals separately have been explored and looked at, there's very little information on the experiences of transgender people of color, so individuals who hold both of these identities simultaneously. So again, looking at just this is issue of intersectionality and looking at these forms of discrimination separately, but not in combination with each other, which I'm really glad that I was able to find an article that does look at the combination of those identities and how they work together to create forms of discrimination and oppression and experiences for people who hold both those identities that are different from people who hold those identities individually. This article really does a good job of taking into consideration intersectionality. And it's actually a study, so it actually talks with transgender people of color specifically, conducts semi-structured interviews and allow transgender people of color to share their own experiences in their own words, which I thought was pretty cool. So basically some of the findings of this report were that all of the transgender people of color who took part in the study reported having negative experiences due to their race and or gender identity. A major aspect of the reported negative experiences was the healthcare provider's refusal to respect the identity, the gender with which the transgender people of color identified with. At the same time, a lot of the respondents reported discrimination that was based on both their race and gender identity at the same time. So one quote from this study that a transgender person of color participant shared was, as someone with a Mexican last name and as a Mexican person, I think folks will raise their eyebrows about that, the fact that I'm bringing in a passport. Like, is this a cover-up? Is this someone who's like kind of using false document? Which is funny because my motivation to use it is actually about my gender identity. A black transgender woman shared that my provider would make assumptions about me just because of my race and my being transgender. Like, oh, so are you a sex worker? Are you this? Are you that? A Latinx transgender man shared, I think there's a lot of assumptions made about people of color, and then again, just like trans people of color, who that they're somehow like less educated, less resourceful less resourced, less supported than their white counterparts. Some other quotes from this article include, I like force myself to endure more pain or more discomfort because I want to wait until I can get somewhere where a doctor is going to call me by my name and gender me properly. And she told me she was uncomfortable with me as a human being. Just to show an example of what a positive healthcare experience for a transgender person of color can be like, one respondent shared that their healthcare provider knew that top surgery was also different for white people versus people of color. She actually went and had examples and photos to show me about how scars might look different or how healing might look different, which never in a healthcare experience have I even had a doctor, a white doctor specifically, who is aware of how that might be different for me and actually gave me advice about that. So basically what this article shows is just how both being transgender and being a person of color can affect the healthcare experiences of transgender people of color. And 
Sometimes it may be related to them being trans. Sometimes it may be related to them being a person of color, but sometimes it may be both. And at the same time, they're always navigating and kind of watching out for and have the risk of experiencing oppression from either one of these directions every time they go to a healthcare setting. So coming back to the idea of intersectionality and transgender people of color facing discrimination based on both the identities of being transgender and a person of color, I wanted to discuss this other article I found called Transgender People of Color at the Center, Conceptualizing a New Intersectional Model. One of the main things I wanted to point out from this article is that it does also have qualitative interviews with transgender people of color and focuses a lot on the criminalization aspect of transgender people of color. So before I get in too deep to this, I actually want to step aside here for a moment, throw it over to other Kai, Kai who's standing up as opposed to Kai who's sitting down, because I want to discuss prisons and the prison system and the 13th Amendment. In my anthropology class this past semester, we had a reading called Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. The main part of this reading that I wanted to point out was that it talks a lot about the connections between the prison system and slavery and basically just the regulation of the lives of black people in America. So the 13th Amendment was meant to abolish slavery and mostly it did except there was a little loophole in it. And that was where it said basically that slavery is illegal unless it is as a form of punishment. Meaning that if you were convicted of a crime, you could be put back into slavery in the form of incarceration. Right after slavery was abolished in the former slave states, black codes were created to regulate black people and their behavior. And actually, before slavery was abolished, 90% of those in jail, in prison, were white. But right after slavery was abolished, there's a giant spike in the amount of black people being sent to prison. And a lot of this had to do with these black codes and laws that were meant to target black people specifically. Today, there is still a large disparity between the amount of black people in prison and the amount of white people in prison or the amount of people of color in prison in general compared to the white population in prison. And it's disproportionate based on the amount of crimes that, ha that are committed by people of color and people who are white. And it's disproportionate to the amount of people of color in the United States population as a whole. The prison system still works to oppress people even beyond just incarceration. People who are convicted of felonies in many states lose their voting rights. And that's just one example of the way that someone, even when leaving an actual physical prison, can still find themselves at a disadvantage or with less rights than other US citizens. And another thing that the article by Davis talks about is how this is still a thing that's ongoing, the discrimination and oppression caused by criminalization of people of color is still happening. A common argument is that that's all in the past and things are equal now, but there's still a lot of evidence to show that criminalization is still aimed towards people of color more than it is towards white people people of color are still under surveillance more than white people. People of color are still more likely to have police encounters and be incarcerated than their white counterparts. I think even just the other day, I think it was just yesterday actually, I was reading through the news and I saw an article that talked about how multiple police officers in New York were actually coming forward and saying they were told to specifically target people of color in the subway system. So this is not a thing of the past. People of color are still at higher risk for criminalization, incarceration, police surveillance, police brutality, and that's basically what I wanted to say about the prison system with a little bit of help from the article by Angela Davis.
So now that we understand kind of the role that prisons play in our society and how they're connected to slavery, I think that ties right into some of the stories that this article shares from transgender people of color with criminalization and police encounters. So one of the people who took part in the study said that, I find that people are scared of me. They see a dark eyed, haired, non-Anglo man walking near them off the train at night and they are scared. I am more scared of police who are always stopping me in my car. Being a Latino blue collar male, I am seen as a troublemaker and I'm not used to that. So one thing this article really discusses is the transition from being a woman of color to being a man of color and how that kind of plays a role in the experiences of trans men of color because although women of color and men of color both face criminalization, men of color tend to face it at a higher rate and are seen as more dangerous and more likely to be committing crimes and being troublemakers. And when transitioning from a woman of color to a man of color, trans men often find themselves at a new heightened level of surveillance and criminalization and dealing with the police and all that. Another quote is from a black trans man who was being pulled over. He said, I made the same decisions I would make as a woman and not recognizing how that decision being made and me being perceived as male looks to the police. And the realization is that no benefit of the doubt was being put in my direction whatsoever. I'm a black trans man who has been to jail. Although I was on the women's side, my driver's license said female, so they had to put me on the women's side. They couldn't put me on the men's side. Oh no, there was no doubt that they were sending me to jail. This guy was so pissed off, pulled over for speeding. I didn't pull over when he wanted me to, and the cop just absolutely lost his mind. I perceived it as a safety concern, and he perceived it as a belligerent black man not doing what I tell you to do situation. So in this, there's a couple things going on. There is the transition from being a woman of color to being a man of color, and kind of that increased level of police brutality, although not to discount the fact that many women of color are also victims of police brutality. There is also this discussion of the author kind of points out that he has talked to white transgender men who have actually kept the F on their license because it will work for them in the way of keeping them out of jail sometimes. But black men of color or um, at least in this situation, don't have that same experience, whether they have male or female on their license. If, they're, if they are perceived as male, they will come under the spotlight of criminalization and police surveillance. And then even when they are found out to have an F on their license, it doesn't really change anything. And sometimes it can even make things worse because now they are seen as transgender as well, which can add on additional harassment, as well as misgendering and all that doesn't get much better when you get into the jail and you are continuing to be misgendered, placed with women, which could be a safety thing, but also kind of have to consider the effects that might have on someone's mental health, someone's mental well-being. You can even be placed alone for your own safety, and it's no secret that being placed alone for long periods of time can be very detrimental to mental health. So one thing this article also does is it actually takes into consideration the experience of white transgender individuals because it wants to look at their experiences in comparison to the transgender people of color's experiences. And there's an interview in here, I'm not going to quote it because it's a little bit longer than the ones I've quoted before, but there's an interview in here with a white trans man and his experience with law enforcement. He talks about a time when the police came to his place of residence, basically saying that they thought he was selling drugs. And this white trans man wasn't very cooperative. He actually noticed that the police were getting angry with him. But at the end of the day, the police officers convinced him that they had probable cause to search his place. So he ended up going back and bringing them some marijuana that he had. And basically, he said that if the cops needed to arrest him, he was just going to need to talk to his lawyer. And the police officers ended up responding that they 
We're not going to arrest him. And the main point of sharing this story in comparison with the other stories that we heard with the trans men of color is that we see kind of similar situation. The cop was getting frustrated and angry with, with the white trans man. And it's even a much more serious type of issue compared to like speeding, how, how the laws are usually dealt with. Drug offenses are usually dealt with a lot more seriously than speeding offenses. And yet the black trans man who was pulled over for speeding got arrested where as the white trans man who gave the police officers the drugs he had ended up being left to obtain a lawyer and go about his day basically and that's just kind of to show the comparison between how people of color are treated in comparison to white people with law enforcement and criminalization and incarceration the final thing i want to talk about with this article is actually one specific part of it that says and i quote although these experiences of increased surveillance of men of color are not a revelation Trans men of color shared their initial surprise when this began. They addressed how resources from white trans communities did not adequately prepare them for this. End quote. The reason I wanted to point out this specific two sentences is because it really resonated with me and made me think about another reading we did in my anthropology class this past semester. I apologize if I say the name of this river incorrectly, but the name of the reading was the Combahee River Collective Statement. And basically what this was is it was a statement made by black feminists addressing the limitations of feminism and basically saying that feminism is more of a white women's movement than a women's movement because it doesn't address the unique challenges that black women face as women of color. It really works within a framework of just sexism and Addressing just sexism isn't good enough when it comes to the experiences of black women because they face sexism and racism. And I really just wanted to point that out because it really made me draw this connection between what this article was saying about how white transgender resources didn't prepare trans men of color for everything they were going to experience as men of color, as trans men of color. It really was within more of a framework that seemed to address only cis sexism and not other forms of discrimination and oppression such as racism. And I mean, obviously I'm talking about the hashtag TPOC in my larger argument, so I'm focusing on racism, but you could really exchange that with other forms of oppression such as ableism, for example, and it's kind of the same idea. You can't just address one form of oppression because that's only one part of the community. And if you only focus on cis sexism, you're leaving out certain individuals within the community in those resources. It's really important to address both of those because when people have these intersecting identities, especially with something like race that's so ordinary within our society, it is just there within the experiences of a transgender person of color's life. And in the way feminism has felt like a white woman's movement because it didn't address forms of oppression such as racism, transgender resources can feel like a white transgender person's resources if they don't address things like racism. So now that we understand that transgender people of color face oppression and discrimination in ways that white transgender people and cisgender black people do not, in addition to the forms of discrimination and oppression they do share with these groups, we can finally look directly at the hashtag TPOC. So I wanted to go ahead and take a look at my Instagram and see where I've used the hashtag TPOC. Um, I'm on a collab channel a transgender related collab channel and that's where I it has its own Instagram and that's where I usually use the hashtag TPOC so I don't have as many here but I know these two I believe this was a after top surgery I wanted to show off uh, a new chest and 
my new tattoo. Um, but I believe here I've used TPOC uh, right there for the focus. There we go. Two years post op top surgery. I guess my chest wasn't that new, but um, and then this one. Scroll all the way back now. I believe this one I also use hashtag TPOC. Yeah, right there. There it is. This was my again top surgery related content. <laughs> That was my first time swimming after top surgery in like a pool, public pool. First time at the beach, five grade. <laughs> and I was, I love taking shirtless pictures after that. Kind of forgot about that video, but yeah, used uh, TPOC, hashtag TPOC. So that's some of the usage on my personal Instagram. 2018-ish, two years post-top surgery. The final article I wanna share with you is called Transgender Youth of Color and Resilience, Negotiating Oppression and Finding Support. The really awesome thing about this article is that it really, I mean, I just completely identified with it. So I'm 23 right now, but I really could remember myself as a teenager when reading this because it deals with mostly teenagers and their experiences with oppression and resilience and how they find support and all that stuff and I just it really brought me back to when I was a little bit younger and going through all this myself. So 13 transgender youth of color were interviewed for this study and real quick I just want to go back and explain a little bit more about my own racial formation and how I really came into identifying as a person of color myself. I feel like it took me a little bit longer and that might be because I'm biracial, I'm half black and half white. I'm not really sure. All I know is it was, wasn't was until about two years ago, a little bit after, shortly after I turned 21, that I really started to identify as a person of color and really understand what that identity meant and really find a community within that identity. And I really think it started with having the opportunity to join a therapy group called QTPOC. So QTPOC, Q-T-P-O-C stands for Queer and Trans People of Color. That's what the group was called. And within this experience of being able to go to a space that recognized both of my identities in a place where I was able to express both of my identities and talk about how both of my identities affected me simultaneously really gave me my first glimpse of what it can be like to identify as a transgender person of color as opposed to just transgender or just a person of color because both of those identities really play a big part in my life and my life experiences and that was really when I started to pick up on being a person of color myself when I finally had access to other people who shared that same identity with me and that's probably around the time when I also started using the hashtag on Instagram. So, like I said before, this article just really brought me back to that time. I know I was like 21-ish, but uh, these are mostly teenagers, some of them like 18, and it really brought me back to that time in my life when I was figuring out how to identify as both transgender and a person of color. So out of the 13 people that were interviewed for this study, all 13 said that they were unable to separate their gender identity from their racial slash ethnic identity. And I, once again, want to share a quote real quick. So an 18-year-old African-American trans man shared, I used to use words like gender, queer, or transgender only to describe myself. Today, I would say I am a black trans youth. And these words are more specific to what is going on with me and my body right now. 
I used to describe as gender queer or black almost like being different things depending on where I was community setting that sometimes still happens but being black and trans is more important to me than being gender queer or black additionally 12 out of 13 of the participants who took part in this study said that being able to use their own words and define for themselves their racial identity and their gender identity gave them a source of empowerment and pride within themselves. The more they accepted and valued their m multiple identities, the more they were able to connect and express both of their identities. And also this self-definition process was described as ongoing. All 13 of the participants said they would like a transgender youth of color specific community. Another awesome thing about this article is it goes and talks directly about the role of social media in affirming the identities of transgender youth of color. All 13 of the participants described social media playing a significant role in them starting to understand their multiple identities and the connections between them. An 18-year-old African-American trans man shared this. I didn't know other people who were trans and black when I was coming out as trans. I was online all the time. I subscribed to these YouTubes and watched stories about hormones, surgery, family, partners, you name it, it was there. I'm not always strong even though I feel like I have to be. And that's when I would get on one of these YouTube channels. It's another world even online. Some of the other participants said it's cool to have people to look up to on social media. And some express using social media to express themselves and connect with others like them when they couldn't really find that in their immediate surroundings, such as like at school. All the participants explained that social media helped them see new perspectives, perspectives that were transgender positive and ethnic slash racial identity affirming. They were able to use these perspectives to empower themselves and also gain new strategies on how to combat racism and trans prejudice within their own lives. Again, I just thought that article was super cool. It really brought my mind back to a period in my own life when I was really going through trying to figure out my transgender and racial identities, how they both play a role in my life, make connections between them, and really feel empowered by the people around me who shared those identities with me and gave me new perspectives on them. And I think this article just does a great job of showing how social media can play a real big role in that and exposing people to communities like them and communities that support them and empower them and give them new perspectives and new strategies regarding how their identities can play a role in their life. So finally going back to where this video started, given everything I've talked about in this video, is hashtag TPOC a racial project? I would say hashtag TPOC is a racial project. I would say it is because it shows that our experiences of being a transgender person are also within the framework of being a person of color. It makes it known that race plays a role in our lives. The way in which it plays a role in every person of color's life. It is a normal, usual part of our everyday experiences. That is undeniable in contrast to the ways it can be easily overlooked or even completely ignored by those who are white. Additionally, it gives transgender people of color a place to share their own experiences, their own stories, in their own words. A way to be visible and show that there is no single story of the trans experience. It creates a community for us, by us and allows transgender people of color to find others like them who will support and empower them in their own recognition of the ways in which their gender identity and racial identity connect and interact. So thank you for watching this video. All the sources I use for the information in this video will be listed in the description below. As always, stay strong, stay safe, and stay. Hope to talk to you soon. Peace.